We're going to talk about routers that are pretty horribly broken and then you can't fix them apparently but you are going to break them to fix them if they are broken. Good? Yeah, sure. I'm a lawyer. I do what I can. Let's give our next speaker a big round of applause. All right, thank you everybody and uh, welcome. Uh, so this is Help Me, uh, uh, Help Me Vulnerabilities, You're My Only Hope. Uh, and this talk is about using vulnerabilities to determine if your MicroTik router has been exploited. Um, and I actually talk a lot about code that I wrote and data I collected. Um, and I actually just pushed this all to GitHub this morning. Uh, slides are up there too. Um, so check that out when you have a chance. Uh, and here's just the talk's agenda. I'll start with some background on MicroTik and why their routers are interesting. Uh, in the middle, I'll present uh, the problem MicroTik administrators are facing, uh, and then I'll present a solution to that problem. Uh, finally, after we get root, uh, I'm going to do a brain dump of all the fun places uh, attackers can hide in router OS uh, that I know about. Uh, but I'm going to start with a very brief introduction of myself and uh, some work I've done. Uh, my name is Jacob Baines, and I use the handle of Vinyl Lobster. Uh, I work at I work at Tenable uh, as a member of the Zero Day research team. <coughs> uh, and on the research side, I really like working on MicroTik routers. Uh, the system design is uh, fairly interesting and it uses a custom protocol that it's fun to interact with. Uh, and I've written about the routers a few times, as you can see. Um, and that's my bald head up there at DerbyCon last year talking about the custom uh, protocol. Uh, and I've also found a few vulnerabilities in the system, a couple of which will be featured uh, in this talk. Uh, but not everyone's familiar with MicroTik, so I want to introduce the victim. Uh, MicroTik is a Latvian company, uh, and they produce networking devices and associated software. Uh, and the products uh, they sell are deployed around the world, and for a few reasons, uh, they have a very enthusiastic user base. Uh, not just on uh, their MicroTik forums and not on places like Reddit, but also uh, they hold MicroTik user meetings across the globe, uh, which can uh, yield some pretty interesting results. And I'll speak about that in a little. <laughs> but like I was saying, MicroTik makes routers, uh, and since I work on these routers a fair amount, uh, I inevitably try to talk to my coworkers about these. Uh, unfortunately, I believe this is what comes to mind when I'm talking to them, uh, just this little Soho router. Uh, which inevitably yields this expression, because who really wants to listen to some guy talk about a Soho router for months on end? <coughs> but when I think about uh, MicroTik, this is what I'm thinking about. Uh, this is a cloud core router, and it has uh, 36 cores, and it advertises 28 gigabit per second throughput. Uh, and what's really interesting is uh, th that little Soho and this big router, uh, they actually share the same operating system called Router OS. Uh, now this router is good enough for a large enterprise or an ISP, uh, and in fact I know it's used by ISPs uh, because uh, they like to show up to these MicroTik user meetings and give a presentation on their ISP deployments featuring these MicroTik routers. Uh, you don't have to take my word for it, I linked a bunch in here. Uh, and I actually stole this screenshot uh, from a small ISP in the Philippines. You can see it's just a handful of cloud core routers in Iraq. <coughs> and of course, uh, you can actually find quite a few MicroTik routers on Shodan. Uh, the router does have a bunch of management interfaces, uh, so it's kind of hard to get an exact number on how many are internet facing, but you can see uh, the web interface right there is about 600,000. Um, but one interface you won't find on Shodan is for this guy, uh, and this is the screenshot of their management client called Winbox. Uh, it uses a custom protocol over 8291 in order to communicate to the router, uh, and as far as I know, none of the internet scanning search engines uh, actually index this, um, which is really unfortunate because most of the recent vulnerabilities for MicroTix, uh, they use uh, port 8291 as the attack vector. Uh, however, uh, back in March, before they got Krebsed, Packettel did an internet wide scan of TCP port 8291, uh, and they actually tossed the results up on their website. 
Uh, and uh, the website's now kind of down, or last I checked it was, um, but you can grab the results off the Wayback Machine. And what you find in that data set is 3.6 uh, million IP addresses that respond to that TP TCP scan. Uh, and that's a pretty useful data point, I think, uh, but doesn't say exactly how many are, act are really Microtech routers. And since last year, I'd actually released a library that can talk to this Microtech protocol. Uh, I figured, well, why don't I scan these 3.6 million addresses and determine which ones are Microtech? <coughs> and so that, that is what I did. Uh, I wrote the scanner. Uh, and it ran in late June into July of this year. Um, and mind you, the packet tell data was from March, so it was getting a little stale, but I was able to identify half a million of Microtech routers with their Winbox exposed to the internet, um, which according to Microtech itself is a pretty big no-no. Uh, also interestingly, uh, at least 40% of uh, the scan routers were vulnerable to a firewall bypass that I had published in February. Um, so that's just our first indication of uh, the poor patching practices. Um, so this pie chart itself uh, is not super interesting, but I have a specific point I want to make here. Uh, you can see that 60% uh, of the devices I scanned have been patched in the last year. And that's that rather large chunk that says uh, newer than 6.43 RC4. Uh, but everything else is more than a year behind in patching. Uh, most notable is the older than 6.28 chunk, and router OS 6.28 is more than four years old now. Um, and all I'm really trying to say here is uh, Microtech, Microtech administrators are not well known for their good patch patching practices. Um, so that leads very nicely into this section. Uh, Microtech routers have seen a number of exploitation campaigns over the last few years, uh, so I want to discuss some of those. Uh, so we can start in 2017 uh, and WikiLeaks released Vault 7. And Vault 7 uh, contained this zero day exploit uh, that was called Kaime Red. Um, now Vault 7 didn't actually contain the, uh, the exploit code or an explanation of how it works. Um, but Microtech did issue a patch, uh, and as far as I know, Big Nerd 95 here was the first to reverse it and figure out how it worked. Um, and it's an unauthentic unauthenticated stack clash in the web server. And as we've seen, there are about 600,000 web servers currently available. Uh, and about a year later, in February 2018, Kaspersky published their research on Slingshot APT. Uh, now, Kaspersky noted that Slingshot had exploited Microtech routers with an unknown vulnerability uh, in order to replace some DLLs on the router. Uh, and the DLLs actually get downloaded by the Winbox client. Uh, so not only did Slingshot uh, exploit these routers, but they're able to exploit the downstream admins as well. And still, not long after that, in May 2018, uh, Talos uh, released their first iteration of their VPN filter work and Microtech routers were also caught up in that. Uh, again, no specific vulnerability mentioned, uh, but Microtech's official statement implied that the, the exploit was Kaime Red. Um, although I personally take that with a grain of salt. Uh, either way, I want to point out this FBI notice uh, that simply states uh, for everyone to reboot their routers, uh, and we will see later that that is not gonna remove malware from a Microtech router. Uh, so this is more of an ongoing thing to my understanding. Uh, this is a picture from a very nice analysis done by Trend Micro of, on TrickBot from March 2019. Uh, and you can see the threat actor uh, was actually using exploited Microtech routers to run command and control uh, on their installed TrickBots. Uh, it's a great way to stay hidden, uh, but really not great for the router owners. Uh, so this post ac uh, actually appears on the Microtech forums on April 20th, 2018, and it basically says, uh, someone has logged into my router, and now I have a couple weird bash scripts in my user directory. Uh, and a couple posts after that, a guy running a wireless ISP uh, comes on and says, yeah, we're seeing the same thing. 
Uh, and so this turns out that it was uh, actually zero day being used in the wild. Uh, and three days later, Microtech actually issued a patch for this, which is a pretty good turnaround in my opinion. Uh, and their statement basically says, uh, you know, someone with a custom tool can connect to the Winbox port without authentication, download the user uh, database, and recover usernames and passwords. Uh, but that's it for details. There was no POC, there's no CVE. Uh, but a month later, uh, a couple researchers posted this analysis of the vulnerability, and shortly after that, they published a working POC. And then um, after that, finally, CVE 2018 14847 uh, was assigned. Uh, and, this, and the POC they wrote uh, actually gives the attackers credentials they need to log into the router and start messing with the configuration. And, um, you know, as we've seen, MicroTik routers don't get patched very quickly, uh, so people kind of ran with this. Uh, one of the things they did was inject CoinHive JavaScripts into the custom 404 page uh, that the router can serve up. Uh, this is a tweet from Bad Packets Report, and it was around the peak of this coin hive madness in uh, October 2018, which you can see a quarter of a million affected routers. Uh, but other attackers had other ideas. Uh, one of the good features of MicroTik routers is that they can uh, su they support packet capture and forwarding. Uh, so according to NetLab 360, um, about 7,500 routers have their packets forwarding to a third party. Uh, and another attack um, mentioned by NetLab had a uh, nearly quarter of a million routers uh, with their SOX4 proxying enabled just for this one specific net block, uh, which I thought was both weird and fascinating. And I've skipped over other threats like Kame Blue, uh, but I think you guys kind of get the idea at this point. And the reality is none of this stuff is really going away. So this is a tweet just last month from Gray Noise. Uh, and uh, if you're not familiar with gray noise, uh, they have honeypots all over the place. Um, and you can see here uh, they notice a very large increase in scans for CVE 2018, 14847, just last month. And I'd actually uh, written and uh, deployed my own Winbox honeypot around that same time period. And uh, while the numbers weren't crazy, almost every connection to the honeypot was uh, an exploitation attempt uh, and it only took uh, about an hour and a half of the honeypot being online uh, before it, um, the first exploitation attempt rolled in. Uh, and again, like everything uh, in this talk, both the code and results are up on GitHub. And of course this is a sort of different kind of threat. Um, Zerodium tweeted this earlier this year uh, and this, uh, this offer is still on their website last I checked. And uh, while this isn't Apple zero day money, it certainly isn't nothing either. Uh, so presumably, Zerodium has someone they want to sell this to. Uh, so why did we talk about all that? Well, hopefully I convinced you that these routers, uh, you know, they're not just little home routers, but they're also big beefy enterprise RISP routers. Um, and, you know, they've been exploited quite a bit. Uh, but what is the problem I'm here to talk about? So this is the problem. Um, from left to right, you're looking at Winbox, Webfig, and the Microtik terminal. Uh, and this is more or less uh, what the administrator has to interact with the device. Uh, when what you won't find is um, a real shell, any way to uh, access the underlying file system, um, the administrator really runs in a jail and um, uh, they, they just don't have any way to know if they've been exploited. <coughs> and I'm not the only one to notice this. Uh, this is just a small sample of uh, people on the Microtik forums wanting to know how they can tell if they've been exploited. <coughs> and this is actually Microtik's official statement in response to CVE 2018-14847. Uh, I highlighted the good part. You can see it says there's no way to know if you were affected. Uh, and the security community isn't uh, much better because what we do, what do we do? Uh, we write nice blogs, I'm certainly guilty of that, and we publish file hashes. 
uh, but a microtech administrator can't actually access the file system, um, so the file hashes aren't incredibly useful to them. <coughs> so that's kind of where the microtech community is, uh, blindly hoping they weren't exploited or if they have upgraded that that um, actor has been pushed out. Uh, but to my thinking that isn't very acceptable because uh, there are serious implica implications uh, for any person or organization with a compromised router. Uh, you really do need to know if you're affected or not. Uh, but without any type of official solution uh, and really no other alternative, uh, we turn to our only hope. Uh, and that's the vulnerabilities themselves. Uh, so perhaps we can jailbreak these routers and get some answers. Uh, but there is one immediate problem with my plan uh, and that's, that's the number of architectures that router OS actually supports. Uh, I think Microtech has a goal to collect all the architectures. Um, but writing and maintaining stable shellcode for all these architectures uh, would surely be an obnoxious task that I certainly was not willing to undertake. The other problem is uh, Microtech releases so many versions of router OS. Uh, they have even released a version since I gave these slides to DEF CON. Um, and you can see since 2013, uh, they've released about two official versions per month. Uh, that's ignoring all the release candidates. Uh, and that's just a lot of versions we need exploits for. Uh, and uh, it would be tough to test uh, stable exploits across all those versions. <laughs> so that's kind of two strikes against my vulnerability saving the day plan. Uh, but this is our saving grace. Uh, router OS has a back door in it. Um, it's there on purpose. Uh, if a special file exists in a specific location, uh, you can gain login, you can log in as uh, the devel user and get a root busy box shell. Uh, and I cannot emphasize enough, uh, users cannot, they should not, and they were never intended to be able to make this file and get this root shell. Um, I think with some help from our vulnerability friends, uh, we might be able to get root and answer some questions. <laughs> so here's the first vulnerability. Uh, this was actually found by Hacker Fantastic and it was dropped as a zero day on December 11th, 2018 and Microtech uh, shortly followed up uh, with some patches. Uh, this vulnerability has no CVE and it's just a simple arbitrary file creation bug. Uh, you can, you literally just tell the telnet client to uh, create a file. Uh, pictured here you can see that I tell the telnet client to set trace file slash ram slash package slash option uh, and that just happens to be the backdoor file. I then log in as devel and get a busy box root shell. Uh, and just a quick note about vulnerabilities requiring authentication on router OS. Uh, the system uh, ships with a default admin user uh, with no password um, and neither login for the web interface or the Winbox interface have any sort of brute force protection. Uh, so I've written a couple of POC to prove that out. So while Hacker Fantastic's bug does require authentication, uh, it's still quite serious. Um, but back to the bug itself. Uh, when Hacker Fantastic dropped this vulnerability, it was just a basic breakdown. Uh, of how you would man manually type in the attack. Uh, writing a full POC requires the author to know how the Winbox protocol works and since I'm one of the three or four idiots that publicly understands that, I went ahead and wrote these POC uh, that automate Hacker Fantastic's exploit uh, and these will create the backdoor file um, so you can log in as root. <coughs> so this next vulnerability is one that I found uh, and it was patched twice once in March of this year in the stable branch of router OS and then again in May uh, in the long term uh, version of iOS. Uh, interestingly, Microtech doesn't actually flag this uh, patch we see here um, as a vulnerability. Uh, they simply call it improved file handling uh, and they don't even mention the CVE I signed. But either way, uh, this bug is a file traversal bug um, and it gives you the ability to um, both uh, create directories and read or write files. Um, so it's very powerful uh, but does require authentication. <coughs> so I have a couple POC for this. Um, again, it just creates the back door. 
um, and again it works uh, all the way up through May of this year. Uh, finally, the last vulnerability that we'll be using uh, is CVE 2018-14847. Uh, and this, this is the vulnerability that actually started out on the Microtech forums. Uh, uh, this is all, it also turns out that this is a, a file traverse, a directory traversal bug, uh, and it can also be used to read or write files anywhere on the box. Uh, since I already released an exploit for this back uh, for DerbyCon, um, there's nothing new to release today. Uh, but basically, the summary of the situation uh, is we have these three great file creation vulnerabilities, uh, and they work over a variety of interfaces. Uh, and all of them can create the backdoor file to enable the root shell. Um, you know, and also the Microtech community has this general problem uh, that they can't determine if they've been owned or not. So I'd like to introduce you to a little tool I wrote. It's called CleanRAS, and CleanRAS aims to be a very simple tool. The user simply provides the IP of the router, a username, and a password, and CleanRAS will do the rest. Uh, it'll exploit, uh, it'll either try exploiting the uh, Winbox interface or the web Webfig interface. Uh, it automatically figures out the router's version and then creates the backdoor file however or wherever that version dictates. CleanRAS gets root on versions of RouterOS from 2011 all the way through May of this year by using the three vulnerabilities we talked about. Uh, RouterOS is versions three through six. All are, all are supported uh, and all architectures are supported um, because again, none of these vulnerabilities actually require any type of shell code. Uh, another thing that actually comes with CleanRAS is a little script called RASSH. Uh, all you do is you upload that to your uh, router and with your brand new root shell, you run it and it will look for all sorts of bad stuff in the router and let you know what is there. So it's really cool that we got root and that there's this little script to find all the bad stuff in the router. Uh, but this is DEF CON and we want to know about all that bad stuff. Uh, so let's go exploring post exploitation. Uh, and first of all, a small disclaimer. Uh, this, this discussion is really going to focus on router OS 6.0 and above. Uh, because before 6.0, as you can see, the entire file system was read write. Um, so you didn't need any special tricks to hide in the system. But modern router OS is quite different. Uh, it's full of tempfs and read only file systems. Uh, so surviving a reboot is not necessarily a given. Um, luckily, uh, since the last release of router OS 5 um, was four years ago, uh, there's probably no more 5, 4, or version 3s out in the wild. Uh, there are. <coughs> uh, and just one more final point before uh, we start talking about the interesting stuff. Uh, if you go home and you decide to root uh, a router OS VM or a router you have, uh, do yourself a favor and up upload your own BusyBox. Uh, the built in BusyBox is extremely limited, doesn't even have LS, uh, so it can be quite obnoxious to use. So let's start with something simple. Uh, almost everything should be, let me expand this. Almost everything on the system should be executing out of slash bin, slash dash bin, or slash nova slash bin. Uh, and these are actually read only directories that come from digitally signed package that in theory uh, should be totally trustworthy. Oop. Shouldn't be messing with stuff. Uh, if you see anything executing out of slash read write or uh, slash flash, uh, then you have almost certainly been owned. Uh, so, because that's persistent file safe, uh, persistent file space that router OS does not normally use for execution. Uh, finally, um, you should be looking at sl these slash package items. You can see them in the PS output. Uh, they need to be analyzed a little closer. But before we look at these slash package items, um, you need to understand that everything uh, in router OS is a package. Uh, for example, the files in Etsy and the, bi and the binaries in bin are part, of the are part of this system package. You can see at the bottom of the screen. 
Um, at boot time, a squash FS file system is extracted from these packages uh, and mounted as read only in the package directory. <laughs> and, um, you know, I kind of apologize for this Charlie Dea slide, uh, but this is all I'm trying to say here. Uh, all the packages get mounted in slash package, which it's itself is a read write directory within a temp file system. Uh, and because the package directory is read write, anyone could add their own files there and execute them. Uh, in fact, pictured to the left is a very suspicious looking uh, slash pack, uh, package slash lol directory. Um, and uh, it has a very scary looking RC script. Uh, so what is the takeaway from this slide is basically uh, everything in slash package should either be uh, a mounted uh, read only squash FS file system uh, or a, a valid symlink into bundle. Anything else is malicious. So you can see the LOL directory and the option directory do not belong. So while it's true that package is a place that router OS executes from, you do want to be careful and make sure nothing new has been introduced uh, because if you're just looking at the PS output, you'll get something like this. I'm executing BusyBox. Uh, it blends right in. It doesn't belong. Uh, so since we uh, were messing around in the package directory, uh, I personally found this tidbit a little interesting. There's this check installation button in the packages UI uh, and there's not like a lot of documentation for it. There's no documentation that I could find. Um, but also pictured here is a forum post of uh, some guy that left his router open to the internet just to see what would happen. Uh, and he asks a good question. Uh, how do I know if it's been owned? Will check installation be useful? Um, so uh, I ran check installation with BusyBox running like it was in the previous slide and you can see that uh, micro, uh, that router OS said that's just fine. <coughs> uh, a different thing you want to look at is the, pro is the slash proc slash maps for SNMP, www and the profiler binaries. Uh, and here's a screenshot of SNMP's uh, proc maps. Uh, SNMP itself lives in a read only directory called nova slash bin uh, but you can see that I've gotten it to load a uh, shared object called lol.so. Uh, and that's basically because uh, the SNMP library will loop over all the package directories uh, and if it finds an SNMP subdirectory, it will load any .so that it finds. And this is just part of that SNMP logic. As you can see, uh, it does compare the end of the string versus .so uh, and if it is true then it will just DL open whatever. And of course hiding execution of shared library is pretty neat so I wrote a POC that uses CV 2019-3943 to write this to disk. Uh, the POC will then stop the SNMP process and restart it uh, and that way the, uh, the shared object gets picked up by SNMP uh, and then you can see this constructor gets executed. Uh, the constructor actually deletes itself and um, creates the backdoor file so we can log in. Uh, and I would again like to take a moment to be very petty and say that uh, Microtik did not put out any notification to the customers about this CVE. <laughs> and in fact, you're going to want to check the proc maps uh, for all the binaries. Uh, and that's because the first entry in the load library path is a directory called slash read write slash lib. Uh, and you might recall I said earlier that router OS doesn't execute out of slash read write uh, and that is normally true. Uh, in fact, this directory doesn't even exist. Uh, when you exploit the router, you're going to have to create the lib directory yourself. Uh, but what's really great about uh, slash read write slash lib is that it lives in persistent file space so anything we add there uh, will survive reboots. Uh, so here we are looking at the proc maps of nova bin slash file man uh, and all of the libraries that this binary actually wants to load uh, should be in the read only directory slash lib. Uh, but you can see here highlighted in red that uh, I was able to load uh, 
libz.so out of read write lib. And of course, uh, I have a proof of concept for this one as well, uh, but this time the proof of concept is MIPS Big Endian. Uh, and the way this basically worked is I downloaded the real libz, uh, I added this silly constructor, uh, cross compiled the library, uh, and then I used uh, CVE 2019-3943 yet again to create the lib directory and write the shared object. Uh, and eventually file man will just uh, restart and pick this up. Uh, so uh, this will create the, the back door without rebooting. Uh, speaking of rebooting the system, let's talk about persistence a little bit. <coughs> One of the challenges uh, with the back door file is that in newer versions uh, it actually got moved into temp FS package space. Uh, so what that means is when you reboot the router, uh, the developer back door disappears on versions uh, 6.41 and above, which is nearly most every release since December 2017. Uh, also the behavior of upgrades is still sort of a black box. Uh, lots of uh, files are overwritten, uh, some are deleted. Uh, but back to read write slash lib, like I said, uh, it survives reboots like a champ. Uh, libz in particular gets loaded up somewhere very early in the boot process, uh, so the creation of the backdoor seamless, uh, and it even works in the most recent release, uh, which was July 19th, uh, 6.45.2, uh, which is actually pictured here. Um, so I actually had very high hopes that I could use this mechanism to persist across upgrades. Um, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your view, um, the upgrade process deletes the entire read write lib directory. Uh, so still very good for persisting across reboots, uh, very terrible for surviving upgrades. So switching gears yet again, remember that everything on the system is a package, uh, and the packages use the MPK file format. And part of that format is what appears to be uh, some sort of div digital signature. Uh, before these packages get installed, uh, the signatures are, are verified, um, and then they're stored uh, in the directory slash var slash pdb. Uh, and as I've mentioned before, when the system boots, uh, it unpackages the MP these MPKs and it mounts, it mounts a squash file system that's stored within. So one weird thing about uh, slash var slash pdb uh, is that it's entirely read write. Uh, so as root, we can modify these NPK files. <coughs> uh, and so uh, when I figured this out, I was, I was just wondering what would happen if I overwrote one of these files. Uh, so I had a silly experiment where I just echoed LOL over the system package. And the system package, again, is the one that can, contains all the basic Linuxy stuff, like slash bin, slash lib, slash exe. Uh, so I overwrote it and I rebooted and I was actually uh, met with this error message. You can see it says uh, no system package found and then it went into infinite reboot. Uh, so I wondered, uh, you know, if I can overwrite a package, maybe I can introduce my own. Uh, so I wrote this tool called modify NPK and it takes in a valid uh, microtik NPK and a user created a squashfs file system and it replaces the valid squashfs with the user squashfs. Uh, now obviously since we modify the NPK, the signature is totally invalid. But if you take the output from uh, modify NPK and uh, you create your own package in slash var slash pdb, uh, you reboot the system, what's going to happen? Well here you can see that I've created a package called RAS and I've moved it into var slash pdb and rebooted. And there you can see that my package it actually successfully is installed uh, despite having an invalid signature. And of course each package has their squashfs file system mounted as read only, so what did I put in my squashfs file system? Uh, an RC script. Uh, that j basically just creates the back door at boot time. Uh, and of course since this package was successfully installed, it will survive uh, reboot without any type of issue. 
Uh, but we do finally learn what check installation does, uh, and it appears to validate uh, the MPK files in var slash pdb. Uh, you can see if a user runs check installation, uh, when my, uh, my package is installed, then it gets flagged as a bad image. Now MicroTik did eventually patch this in 6.42.1, uh, but it's unclear to me if they knew they fixed this or um, it just happened to get accidentally fixed. Uh, at the bottom, this is the only release note that I think could maybe sort of be related. Um, but still, given the number of uh, pre 6.42 installs that still exist, uh, to me this is a pretty interesting persistence technique uh, and sort of an even more interesting developer mistake. Uh, so let's talk about uh, RC scripts a little bit. Um, I, and I first saw this uh, in the Kame Red repository, uh, so I can't really take any credit for it. Uh, but in router OS up to 6.40.9, uh, you just you just make an RC uh, directory structure off of flash slash XC, um, and that will be treated like any normal RC scripts. Uh, so if you drop something like S18 LOL, it will be executed uh, next boot. Um, and again, since this is in Flash, it's uh, entirely persistent ac across reboots. Uh, super simple, dead easy persistence method. Um, fortunately, uh, this was fixed. And of course the system has its own RC scripts off of the XC directory uh, and there are two that I want to talk about. Uh, you can see first the 08 um, config script. Uh, you can, it's very simple. If uh, slash r read write reset exists, uh, then it just gets executed. Um, yet again, another dead easy persistence mechanism, uh, but this was fixed after 6.40.5. Um, but in 6.40.1, the script uh, 12 def cf uh, was actually changed so that the contents of read write def conf were executed by an eval statement. Um, and this is still the case. Uh, pictured here is 6.45.2, like I said, just released in July. Um, and this is actually the persistence mechanism that CleanRAS uses for these newer versions. <coughs> Uh, but read write def conf isn't perfect. It has a couple of issues with it. Uh, the first is that if uh, read write def conf exists on the system and no one has yet logged in, uh, then it disables login for everyone, uh, including the back door. Uh, so basically uh, shuts down the device. Uh, and the second thing is that if read write def conf exists, then uh, upgrades silently fail. Uh, it, the upgrade looks like it was successful, um, but it will be the exact same version number, uh, no error logs, no nothing. Uh, so CleanRAS gets around this login issue uh, by uh, using an RC script off of package that simply moves a staged file uh, to read write def conf at shutdown. Um, that seems complicated enough to me that I decided to just make a standalone POC that people can check out if they're interested. Uh, basically, the POC uses CVE 2019 uh, yet again to create a DEF CONF file, and once the system is rebooted, uh, the DEF CONF file will get executed and it uh, will uh, put that persistence mechanism into place. Uh, I never found any type of solution uh, for fixing a uh, disabling upgrade, so I'm just going to call that a feature. Uh, and in fact, I never found any way uh, to maintain uh, execution through an upgrade, uh, although I'm sure it exists. Um, but, you know, if you can't maintain execution, what can you do? Uh, so my solution was just to drop a symlink, uh, a hidden symlink in the user directory that the MicroTik user can actually access. Uh, you can see here I've actually FTP'd into the router and I found the symlink dot survival uh, and it's a symlink to root. Uh, and it's worth noting if you're using either Winbox or the web client, uh, neither of them show hidden files so they can't see this symlink. <coughs> uh, and so this is just an example of me uh, regaining execution using the symlink. Uh, you see I have this def comp file, I FTP in, 
I traverse the symlink, uh, move to the read write directory, and put defconf. And after a reboot, um, I log right in as a devel user, uh, and I, I have a full shell once again. This is 6.45.2, uh, just released in July. Uh, and just to prove that the, uh, the persistence, the reboot persistence still works, uh, I rebooted the system, I'm logging again, and I still have my shell. Uh, so that's mostly what I have for you today, uh, and that's uh, actually a fair amount of material, so I wanted to just provide a quick summary, summary slide. And I will not sit here and read this to you, uh, this is more for review, uh, like I said, everything is on GitHub, um, so you can check out the summary if you want. Uh, but I think it's fair to say that I identified a problem with MicroTik routers, uh, offered a solution, and shared various ways I believe attackers uh, could abuse the system. Uh, so one of the best parts of any talk, in my opinion, uh, is to get new ideas for your new, re new ideas for your own research. Uh, so here are just a few things I know uh, that could be tackled. Uh, recently, both the Winbox and JS proxy login algorithms changed. Uh, no one has published anything about those. Uh, that would be pretty useful. Uh, I have never looked at the NPK loader system. Uh, obviously, we see that it has issues in the past that would probably be fun to dive into. Uh, there are actually a lot of kernel modules that MicroTik has written for the system. I have not peeked at any of those. Um, and I did look briefly at package signing and verification and it looked messed up. Um, but I'm not a crypto guy, so it could just be I didn't understand it. Uh, so someone would probably do well to look at that. Um, and of course, we always need more jailbreaks to exp expand cleaner RAS. Uh, and that is all I have for you today. Appreciate everyone coming. Uh, thank you to the goons. Uh, and I can take any questions with what time we have left.